All right. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you today about outside of the just general biology information is work that I did with one of my colleagues, Dr. Chris Dumas, and one of our students, Rebecca uh, Buteau, which is why their names are on there too, because they helped with all of that. And um, just kind of give you an idea, um, I'm going to talk about just very briefly, what does a coyote look like and a little bit of information about it. And then coyote expansion, mostly in North Carolina. And then the survey that maybe some of you guys have participated in about in 2018. I'm going to give you some of that information that we got from it. So starting off with the coyote biology, they weigh about 20 to 45 pounds. They're short, two feet tall from up to the shoulder and three to four feet long. Um, as you get farther north, if you and anybody up from like New England or North Central States. So you've seen coyotes up there, they tend to be a little bit stockier, right? But they're about the same height and length. They just kind of are fuller. So they come in a lot of different colors. Um, so this is also what gets confusing sometimes. People see foxes, like whether they see a gray fox and they're like, that's the biggest gray fox I've ever seen. Or they'll see a red fox and they'll be like, well, that's really big too. Or, you know, sometimes we, as many of you might know, um, we have red wolves um, in North Carolina as well. So it's very easy sometimes to think, okay, well, why is it that color? Um, I think the coyote on, at Halliburton was more of the paler color. Is that correct yes. that you said? Okay, so yeah, color of a golden retriever. Um, I didn't get to see it, but I had my students out here for a field lab uh, a couple weeks ago, and two of my groups of students, when they were away from me, saw it. They came running back, and I'm like, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, sometimes you can see prints. So you know, we live in a place where we got lots of sandy soil. Basically, it is sand, right? Or even along the beaches. And so I always like to tell people one way of how you can tell if it was a coyote print or a dog print. Uh, first off, how many of you have dogs? A lot of them. Uh, when they're not on the leash, do they walk in a straight line? No, they kind of like you know, follow their nose, right? Uh, coyotes in general and most canids will walk in a much straighter line than humans. And then, of course, if dogs are on leash, then you got some human footprints with it, too. So that's a giveaway, right? So coyotes generally tend to walk pretty straight. They know where they're going. Uh, dogs will, you know, make these zigzags and sniff here, go greet those people over there kind of thing. But if you also look at their pads and their prints, dogs have a much splayed pads, um, whereas coyotes are a little bit more diamond shape. Um, so and then you can see the claws a little bit more on that aspect. Um, it's all, you know, when you get out there and the first time you see it, you can kind of think about these things. But until you see them a couple times, it might be difficult to kind of say, yeah, it's definitely a coyote. As I said, um, we do have red wolves in North Carolina and they do look kind of similar, don't they? Um, so, you know, I don't blame people who, you know, knowing if you know we have red wolves in North Carolina and you don't know much about red wolves and you don't know much about coyotes, or maybe you just saw a glimpse of something and you ran back inside, right? <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, I just saw something and it was big and I know it was a dog, right? Um, so just to kind of give you an idea, the, the red wolf is on your left, the coyote is on the right. OK, red wolves are longer. Um, so I told you, I'll we'll go back real quick. You know, coyotes are three to four feet and you can kind of see it a little bit here. But uh, red wolves are, you know, four to even up to like five and a half feet. Red wolves are heavier, too. So kind of more similar to this more northern coyotes in terms of their stockiness. A little bit more subtle differences if you actually get a good look at them or maybe get a picture of them is that wolves have more rounded ears where coyotes have these little pointy ears. And then if you think about, um, you know, like huskies or German shepherds, they tend to have those like wider muzzles. And you can look at the muzzle on the left here that it's a much stronger muzzle and jaw, whereas coyotes tend to be more pointed and narrow. But those are all things that you have to have either a good picture or a really good sight for, right? So maybe Curtis can see because he's got a knife for birds. He can be able to see things real fast. They'd be like, yeah, definitely saw that. <laughs> but most people, when they see a flash of an animal, and that, especially if that animal is scared of them or you're scared of it, then you don't get to see those things. Um, this is a picture of a red wolf um, close up. The back one, I think, pretty sure is a coyote. Um, this is actually a collared red wolf um, that has a radio tracking on it. And all of our red wolves are up in those blue areas in North Carolina. So it's just uh, an experimental 
uh, population where um, they're trying to bring back red wolves. But we do we do not have red wolves down here. Um, so that's always the first question that people ask me. They're like, do we have red wolves down here? And, and again, because they kind of can look similar and especially with those um, color changes, people think, oh, I have we have red wolves in North Carolina. That might be a red wolf. We don't have red wolves down here. We don't have what some people will call coy wolves either because coyotes and wolves, that's one of the issues with red wolves right now is that they are interbreeding, which is hard having a difficulty now for us to be establishing a red wolf population up there. Um, and it's very difficult then to say, well, is that a red wolf or a coyote when you, know, you see one up there? Because um, they do look very similar, um, but we don't have coy wolves coming down this far either. Is the uh, coyote breed is it sterile or? I'm pretty sure they're sterile. Yeah. The expert on, on red wolf biology. Yeah, no, they are not. <laughs> my, uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of the dog species can interbreed. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna have to ask a red wolf biologist for that one. <laughs> if we had them down here, maybe I knew a little bit more about them. But this is all, this picture was taken um, in Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge on a project I was doing with the Wildlife Resource Commission up there. All right, so back to coyotes. Um, they are really flexible in terms of their habitat. Uh, they like wooded areas, they like open grassland areas and agricultural areas, and they like urban areas too. Um, not every animal has done so well as coyotes or raccoons or possums. They kind of get used to our development, but coyotes are definitely one of those that are like, yeah, it's not too bad here, right? Which is why you're all here today, right? And then in terms of their movement and their diet, um, Generally, coyotes are nocturnal. Um, they are really active starting about sunset, like right about now, and then going into the dawn. Now, does that mean that if you see a coyote or any animal that's nocturnal, supposed to be nocturnal, out during the day, it's immediately there's something wrong? No, right? Um, I always like to tell people, you know, we're, we're diurnal. We're daytime creatures, right? But how many of you guys have stayed up all night or up till like late hours? I mean, just think about New Year's Eve, right? You know, we stay up till minute. Well, I don't. I cannot stay up that late anymore. But, you know, we've all been there. We've all stayed up through the night. And that doesn't mean there's something wrong with us, right? It just means that we're happy to be out. Especially um, the animals that you see, if you see them early in the morning. I hear a lot of people in New Hanover County, they're like, oh, I saw when I was getting my car to go to work. And this was right at around dawn. On, right and i'm like yeah that coyote is just going to bed <laughs> you know? it's just going on its way so um definitely keep that in mind if you ever hear that from other people too it's a good way of telling them like ask them how late how many times have you stayed up late at night and you're a daytime person right so um the term home range here if you think about you know where you go on a normal basis so it might be your work might be a place of worship the grocery store um you know one of your friends houses or something like that if you put all those places on a map and then put a circle around them i'm going to know that about you know most of the time i'm going to find you in that circle right <laughs> you're in one of that area and that's what you can think of as a home range so the size of that area of how far you travel on a normal basis for coyotes it's anywhere from two miles squared to 25 miles squared um and that's limited because or it's it's the wide range of that is because of how much they need to go and travel for food um, and then also how many coyotes are in the area. So coyotes are territorial. They do defend their area, but they don't defend the entire place that they roam. They usually defend only two to three miles squared. So if you have a lot of coyotes, their home ranges tend to be smaller because they're all defending certain areas. But if you don't have a lot of coyotes, then their home ranges can be large and they're only spending the energy to defend like this one special area, right? And then what I mean by dispersal is that when coyotes are ready to leave mom and dad, how far away do they go? 
on average about 100 miles. They can go up to 100 miles, I should say. They can go up to 100 miles. Now, does that mean that they always go 100 miles? No. What they're going to do is go to the first place that they find is suitable. So it might be Halliburton Park, where there's nice refuse, there's food, um, there's rabbits and squirrels. Why not? Right? <laughs> so wherever there is no territory being defended and they find places to sleep and eat and drink water, they're going to be good. And then a couple more things about uh, their biology. Um, right about now, which is where you might see a lot of coyotes or a lot of animals in general, especially mammals, they're dispersing. So when animals are ready to leave their mom and dad, this is about the time to do it. This is why we see a lot of deer on the road. We see a lot more roadkill on the road too. Um, January through March, they start mating. This is where you're gonna hear a lot more of them calling, especially foxes. I hear foxes way more across the entire county than I do coyotes. Um, they're the ones that sound like somebody is very getting injured <laughs> or some kind of like scary, something bad happening, but it's a fox. Uh, it's just their communication. And that's a whole another presentation. <laughs> it is like, it is, if you don't know what that sound is and you hear that, you'd be like locking your door. <laughs> um, so coyote gestation, how long they actually are from the time they're pregnant to the time they actually have their babies is the same as our domestic dogs. It's about 60 days. So, you know, if they breed right away in January, it'll be 60 days after that. By March, it'll be, you know, 60 days after that. So pups can be born in a pretty wide span of March through May. Um, generally, they have like four to six pups, but, you know, just like any other animal, including humans, sometimes they can have more. So there's a pretty wide area. And then they hang out with mom and dad from April to July, learn to hunt, start, you know, finding food on themselves. And then when it comes to November or December, they disperse. Um, basically, if they make it to that dispersal period and they make it another year, so they're about two years old, that's about the time that they actually start finding a mate. And when they mate, they do try to mate for life, which is nice. Um, after that, lifespan is about four to six years. Um, normally, unless they're hunted or hit by a car or something of that sort, right? So um, a lot of people always want to know about their communications. Um, there's different ways that coyotes communicate, just like there's different ways that we communicate. Um, sometimes they howl to talk to packs and talk to each other or defend their territory. It's a lot easier to just yell and say, this is my area and don't come over here. And the other group saying, well, this is my area. Don't come over here. Than it is to like go out and protect your area. Uh, distractions, another one, you know, so communicating to distract what they think is some kind of predator or something that's going to come towards their den, especially if they have pups, establishing the territory, and then the pups practice, just like our kids do, right? They practice. So what I hear, and Fallon hears a lot too, is, oh my gosh, there are coyotes, and there are so many of them out there. And a lot of people don't realize that coyotes have this immense vocal, like, strength of like they just make so many different noises and make their sounds so cool so this is just a video off of youtube um there's only four coyotes here but i want you to just listen to it and they're reacting to i think a fire engine <laughs> this is not from new hanover county like i said i just found it on youtube <laughs> it's coming So you can hear, you know, the multitude of voices it sounds like. And I, you know, I get it why people are like, there's like 20 of them out there. And it's like, no, they're just really good at making all these different voices. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> That one's trying to go to the bathroom while it's out. <laughs> I get so excited. <laughs> All right. 
All right. So just real quickly, um, these are slides and maps from the Wildlife Resource Commission. So you can find them on ncwildlife.org under, if you just look under conservation and species, coyotes, and you can find anything about any of the animals that we have. But I love these maps. They try to use these for a lot of different things that they're tracking. Um, so this is where coyotes were um, prior to 18, 1983, um, and they were pretty sparse. Um, they're disjunct because most likely people were taking coyotes from other states and then dropping them off for hunting purposes. Um, coyotes don't naturally just like skip through multiple counties. It's usually a transition from other states moving in. But as you can see, we keep on moving forward, still kind of disjunct. People still all kind of dropping them off here, dropping them off there. And then they start expanding. So they started actually getting, you know, a little bit more uh, territories established, started breeding. 1994, a lot higher. 1998, 2000, 2003, 2005. Um, and then to 2005, oops, so 1998, 2000 is when we got coyotes established here in New Hanover County. Um, and then I think it was just after 2005, maybe between 2005 and 2008 that the outer banks actually got them established so you know they gotta they gotta swim across right so and that, that's a struggle right mm -hmm. yeah they're out there they are everywhere now she's gonna cover that they are native of used to be at some point <laughs> well actually no so well they're native in north america <laughs> but that one's gonna get that <laughs> So uh, maybe maybe you guys are familiar with the coastal feds um, that are here. Um, they had a game camera out and they had posted this picture. So that's um, just one of those on their property. And so um, I just want to give you an understanding of what I'm going to talk about next was uh, Chris, my colleague, and Becky, our student, and I um, recognized that it was about fall this time and like I said, and back in 2017, um, and um, we heard a lot of people start talking about coyotes. They start seeing more on the next door app. It was on the news, things like that, you know. And, and I said to Chris, who's an environmental economist, I said, Chris, you know, we should do a project together, and let's let's just see, you know, where coyotes are in the county, and then also kind of get some information for the county itself. That if the county ever decides that okay, we have a coyote problem, right? then what do the people want? So some sort of baseline, right? And so our community partners were Landfall um, and um, the um, New Hanover County, um, actually the New Hanover County. Um, so the, the commission approved of us doing this. As long as we said, no, we're not actually saying we're gonna put referendums on it. <laughs> it was just a matter of, we wanna take a baseline. And so we were interested in attitudes and perspectives of residents. We were trying to pinpoint specific people who lived here or lived here most of the time, not our tourists, not our students. Uh, and then get a baseline of interactions with coyotes. And then looking at these different methods that might be acceptable or willing to have in North Carolina. Um, so we sent the survey out between May and September of 2018. Anybody here got it? Get it? No, um, there was 4,000 registered voters. Uh, we sent out two follow-up uh, reminders uh, as postcards too, and we let people fill it out online um, and on paper. So we gave lots of different ways to do it. And so this is just our response locations. Uh, we got a good amount of responses, particularly in the most densely areas. This is by zip code. Um, getting down towards, obviously, Fort Fisher, we only had two um, and some of the beaches. So we kind of combined the beaches, actually, to make it easier. And then uh, just kind of giving an understanding of who the people were that responded. 52% of our respondents were female, 41% were male. Um, about two-thirds of the population were 50 years or older, which sums up the taxpayers here in New Hanover County. Um, 82% at least had a college degree or greater. Um, and then in the pie chart is their like, blocks of e economics. And so that's pretty standard towards what New Hanover County has across the whole place. But 89% of the people that uh, answered our survey were aware that coyotes were here. So it was no surprise to them. So that was a good thing, right? Um, and we ask questions like this. So I've got a lot of these figures that where I just put smiley faces, right? So <laughs> make it real easy, right? Green smiley face. 
Yay. Yellow, kind of straight face, neutral, red, either dislike or disapprove, right? So we asked these questions. I support having coyotes. I like coyotes. People are pretty neutral about that. I support having coyotes in New Hanover County. And they are pretty neutral about it. But if you look as we got closer to home, right? Within a mile of my home, eh, staring in that frowny face, right? <laughs> On my property, oh, not so much, right? That's a reasonable reaction, especially for a, a predator, right? Uh, the number of coyotes have either increased, decreased, same or unsure in the past five years. So we're kind of making people think back from 2013 to 2018. 61% of the people said, yeah, coyotes definitely have been increasing, which is about right because coyotes are still expanding through the county, right? Uh, but a good 29% weren't sure, that's for sure. And there was no difference, I did have a note here, there was no difference in terms of whether people thought they were increasing or decreasing across the zip codes either. It was pretty unanimous across the county. So uh, have people seen a coyote? Uh, the gray part is definitely, I've never seen a coyote in New Hanover County. Um, and I've definitely never seen a coyote within you know a couple miles of my house. But we do have people who said, well, maybe I've seen a coyote in New Hanover County. And Definitely seen it. So about a quarter of the people, both around their house and around New Hanover County, have seen it at that time. We also asked about hearing. Have you heard a coyote in New Hanover County? Have you heard a coyote near your house? Red is, yep, definitely heard it. Um, much easier to hear coyotes than to see them often, unless you're becoming nocturnal, right? <laughs> um, sometimes you, wake, you have your windows open and start at night, you, you wake up to it sometimes. Um, interestingly, we have a big block um, in the middle that they've never heard, and then the other side of it is uncertain, like along the river. So that was kind of interesting to see that. Oh, uh, I don't think we actually have a good handle on where the coyotes are. I mean, we have limited green space, um, and it's shrinking as we go. So these coyotes are going to be in green space. Um, so that is a little bit, I mean, if I think about it, and you think about New Hanover County, I mean, you got landfall, you've got the campus, and you've got downtown all in the blue, and the and Wrightsville Beach and everything, all in that orange and blue. So that makes sense. It's more developed. And then you're going up more north. Um, it's 2018, so the Walmart and Pender or Porter's Neck was just opened in 2015. And now obviously that's expanded and that whole area has grown so much. But at least had some vegetation up there for a while. I live up there. So I'm like, I remember when we had trees, you know. And then farther down as we get past um, Monkey Junction, you know, we do still have like more dunes and things of that nature. So that I would say that would probably be a little bit accurate. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah, we have a lot of watershed, saltwater creeks in there and tidal creeks. You're right. Very good. Well, they certainly don't drink it, but I mean, they can go across it. I mean, that's how they got to the Outer Banks. So. And you, yes, that's true, that you can't hear them as much with the noise. Very good, Curtis. I didn't need any there's much, much more concrete and houses and there's many places to run and find food. There's not a lot of green spaces downtown, for sure. So, um, forty-five percent of the people um, that took the survey said they had some sort of interaction with a coyote, um, and there wasn't any difference among zip codes um, between the people who personally interacted with a coyote or the people that had no interaction. Um, so. 45%, well, it was slightly less than half. So we have 45% had some sort of reaction. Now, the way you're reading this is, so I kind of, there's a lot of different things. What this is, this is an established coyote behavioral chart. This was established out in California many years ago, about 2008, I believe, or no, maybe 1998, 1998. Um, and so it's a really good understanding of how coyote behaviors um, can become potentially more concerning, right? The first three on the streets, at on the streets and in yards at night, perfectly natural. They're looking for food. Approaching adults and or taking pets at night, right? Well, you're out there at night. If they see usually a pet first, especially if it's small and prey size, they're going to be interested. Um, coming up near, you know, they're they're not going to come, at least in New Hanover County, I've not heard any 
evidence of people coming, coyotes coming straight up to people. Um, but they, it's at nighttime, you're out nighttime, you're another animal, they're going to see. Unless you're on flight lights and you're making lots of noise, then they're not going to come near you. But if you're just like quietly out there, you're another animal at that point. And then the next one is on streets and in parks and yards during early morning or late afternoon uh, slash daylight hours. So, so I was saying like this crepuscular times so of like they're either going home or, you know, getting out for the day. So if you look at that, um, that's the 30, that's all the ones in green, okay, the 34%, the 3% and 30%. 34% uh, of our residents uh, said they saw them definitely on streets and in yards at night. And another 30% said, yep, saw them on streets and parks and yards during those early morning and night. 3% said they saw a coyote actually coming to them at night. We keep on going around. Uh, the yellow is a little bit more moderate behaviors, uh, more bold behaviors. And then the red are ones that, yes, people should be concerned about in terms of chasing adults during the middle of the day, especially if they're moving um, in and around children's play areas, acting aggressively or anything of like that. And so 11 percent of uh, the residents or the, the respondents did say that. But I will put this as a caveat is that I have done this similar presentation for a couple of years now and people would tell me about their reactions and they said, well, I definitely was in that. Um, and then they kind of realized, well, you know, maybe it didn't chase me, but it was definitely walking after me. And, and it's scary. I get it. Right. You know, like, you know, especially if you're by yourself and you're at night or, you know, you see it, it's like, you know, fear takes on. So, you know, I, I definitely believe that people felt very threatened at this point, but there's, there's some wiggle room in terms of understanding if the coyote is actually being that bold or they just perceived it as being that bold, which fighting people or swallowing up people with dynamite. <laughs> yeah, that's right. With Wiley. I think you're going to talk about that, maybe? Yeah. Summary of the, the research that's been done. Yep. Yeah, so, okay. So, just by zip code, um, it's the same idea. These are the three normal behaviors of coyotes where people have these have had these experiences, um, and so kind of giving you an idea of where they're at. So that's how we wrote it as daylight hours. So that's up to the person to re to interpret, right? Like, is there like is there any evidence of like rabid coyotes? I have not heard any of rabid coyotes in New Hanover County. Uh, we had that bobcat in Pender County. If you saw that video of like <laughs> the guy throwing it, um, <laughs> I'd be like, oh, you guys saw that video probably in the news. Um, but I have not heard of any rabid coyotes in New Hanover County. That usually makes the news and I have not. Perfect. There we go. See, teamwork. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, coyotes, all wild animals, number one, are naturally afraid of humans because we are a main predator on this planet, right? Um, and if they ever start becoming seeming like to you that they're not afraid, Fallon's gonna give you all these awesome tips of how to make sure they stay afraid. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, in North Carolina, just kind of give you an idea of what we could possibly do about coyotes. Um, coyotes can be trapped um, with proper permits and knowing how you're trapping them um, from October through the end of February. Um, I have a relocation question marks. People ask me about it all the time. The only way a coyote can be trapped and relocated in, in North Carolina is if a trapper has a fox pen set up. So that we have places in New Hanover, or not New Hanover, North Carolina that train, that people train their dogs for foxes uh, to hunt foxes and also hunt coyotes. And so they'll put a coyote in there to help train their dogs. So it's a huge penned in like several acres area. So it's not like we're trapping them and moving them out to the pasture, right? They're going to a place where eventually they will meet their demise. Um, and then there's hunting year round where ordinances allow, right? We obviously can't hunt downtown and, you know, um, where public lands are and ordinances are allowed. 
Okay, so usually these kind of things don't really work as well for just the public, although trapping works well in New Hanover County. So our potentials are leave them alone, right? Public education, which is why you're all here, right? Or what we usually consider in the wildlife world is called trapping euthanasia. We hire professional trappers and humanely euthanize them. And so, and then generally those are, you know, the pelts are being used and things of that sort. Okay. <laughs> So again, we got our smiley faces here. We got the zip codes, okay? Um, the one, 28412 is Halliburton Park. Um, I had to look that up. You're like, which, where, where is Halliburton Park in terms of zip codes? <laughs> um, and um, basically how you read these is where the center of the bubble is, is the average. It's where everybody agreed, okay? If you go up to the smiley faces, people are being more in favor of it, of that management technique. If you go down to the sad smiley face, people are less in favor of it. And then how big the bubble is, is how much people disagreed on that. So there's more conflict or disparity in people's answers. So if you look for where Halle Burton is, 28, 412, it's pretty small and it's on the upper side. So most people around, at least in this zip code, say, you know what? I like that idea. Let's just leave them alone. And most people kind of agreed about it. We did have some bigger bubbles and we were more neutral in some other zip codes. 2018. Mm -hmm. And then public education, um, we start at the neutral. There is nobody who is against public education, which as a faculty member at our university, I was very happy to hear. Okay. Everybody's for education. Woohoo! Um, of course, there is disparity in it with the bubble size. Um, but then once again, where Halliburton is, uh, very, very small. Everybody was like, yeah, we really like this idea. We want to learn more about coyotes. We want to learn how to protect ourselves, our, our kids, our pets, um, but then also live with them, right? And so everybody was pretty much on board with that. And then trap and euthanasia, uh, again, more neutral for the most part, except for 28, 429, which is a little bit lower. Um, they were a little bit more against that. But you can see the bubble sizes are pretty big. So even though um, the average was a little bit above neutral in terms of being in favor of trapping euthanasia to some degree, not nearly of as much as public education or leaving them alone, but it's, you know, it does have some disparity in terms of conflict of people's opinions. Countywide, this is where we stand. Um, it didn't matter if people encountered a coyote or not. We looked at if this differed, if people had those encounters or didn't. Everybody was really in favor and supportive of public education. They were a little bit more neutral, maybe a little bit positive for trapping euthanasia. And leaving them alone was more just general neutral. And it was pretty, it, it, people were, you know, on the fence on those. And the last thing that I just want to cover is what um, my colleague Chris worked on for this is part of our survey um, basically said, you know, if we were going to, if the county was going to manage coyotes, right, and there was some sort of referendum on the ballot, right, that would say, you know, are you willing to put this amount of money on, you know, your county taxes to be able to manage them, right, because you got to have money to be able to manage these things, right? Um, there was, he put hypothetical costs on it and it was randomized. Um, leaving coyotes alone was always free because, you know, like, well, I, I hope the county wouldn't charge you for doing nothing at all. <laughs> um, public, <laughs> public education ran from $1 a year to $50 a year per household. Um, and trapping euthanasia ran from $2 a year per household to 100 So it was just random buckets of money. And in terms of those low levels of coyote human uh, interaction, those ones were, you know, two thirds of the respondents encountered just normal coyote behaviors. Um, the far left, it shows you that even no matter how much the management would cost, okay, leaving coyotes alone, they kept on saying, yep, we're still going to be supportive of it. Okay. So, if, you know, even from zero to zero, okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it goes up in terms of like we're getting closer to, um, the third level of maybe uh, coyotes coming towards adults and pets at night. Um, education starts to decrease as management costs increase and trap and euthanasia start decreasing too as we start going through these. Then we go to the opposite side where 11% of people said, okay, I've experienced some things that, you know, could be, could be dangerous, right? It didn't matter what, how much 
we said it was going to cost the referenda. Uh, 5% of the population said, you know, we, I still want to leave coyotes alone. 90% um, of people said, I want public education. I want to know how to make them more afraid, right? And about 80% of people said um, that they would support, you know, paying for something for a trap and euthanasia program. Um, and that's the far end of it. OK, and at the very far end of it, of having a major coyote prog program, I would hope that um, our county would definitely step in way before anything of that ever had happened. And that's part of what, thanks to Andy, you know, we're doing public education here with coyote in the middle of this area. Let's go and talk about it and see how we can kind of live with them. On that note, Fallon, how can I exist with these creatures? And that's the coyote asking about us. <laughs> <laughs> it is is not something that every county in North Carolina gets to enjoy. So this is kind of special that you have you guys have this data that's so localized because that's kind of rare. So you know appreciate appreciate that. Um, it's it's really cool. I think it's really cool. So now, as a biologist with the Wildlife Resources Commission, my job is to talk about managing coyotes because the Wildlife Commission manages wildlife and manages human experiences with wildlife. So I'm going to talk about all of the legal options that are available for managing coyotes and then kind of talk about what the best options are in different situations. And since uh, Dr. Urbanic talked about sort of the expansion of coyotes in North Carolina. I want to zoom out real quick and just show the picture of the range expansion of coyotes across the entire continent. So the red area is the historic native range of coyotes. And as you, as you go, you can see if you spend a little time looking at this, as you go into the orange and then the yellow and then the green and blue, that is the decadal expansion of coyotes across not only America, but Canada, Mexico, and down into um, Central America. And I think they're getting reports of the first coyote sighted across the, uh, the Panama Canal into South America. Now, to, to think about the history of coyote management. Over the past hundred years or so, people have been doing everything they could possibly think of to eradicate coyotes. Um, predator management is something that has been going on and still goes on for a long time. And it's some, some parts of it are good and some are bad. And that's one of the reasons why historically we, we don't have um, nearly the same amount of wolves that we have in the United States and a whole bunch of other larger predators. The same methods that basically significantly reduced predator populations for a lot of other animals did not work on coyotes. They just basically laughed and kept spreading and populating. And um, now we have more coyotes in the world than we ever have in the history of uh, paying attention to these things. So essentially, hopefully this show shares the, the, uh, the concept that not only are coyotes in North Carolina and they're prevalent pretty much everywhere in the, the state at this point, but they're not going away. They're here to stay and it's kind of our job to learn how to coexist with them because at this point, we're just going to have coyotes as far as we know until the end of time. <laughs> yeah. Like, are most a predator of a coyote against my by eliminating the wolves to maybe allow the coyote to work? Red, red wolves and, and to an extent gray wolves, which I can speak less intelligently about because I don't know very much about gray wolves, but um, they do displace coyotes. But coyotes are also much, much more adaptable to a variety of situations where red wolves are very specific. They have specific habitat requirements. So we're not going to have, you know, red wolves in downtown Wilmington displacing coyotes. That's just not going to happen. Um, the story of the future of red wolves, I'm not going to talk about. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we can guarantee that coyotes are going to be around in North Carolina for the foreseeable future. So that said, <laughs> my sort of if there's any takeaway for for you that you can share with your friends, 
The best thing you can do when it comes to learning to coexist with coyotes is to always assume there's a chance that there is a coyote that lives near you. At this point in North Carolina, I like to think of it as there probably not even being a square inch of North Carolina that does not have at least a pair of resident coyotes. They are ubiquitous, they're common, they're everywhere. They're also really sneaky and hard to notice. They're really good at not being noticed by us. So even if you've never seen one, they're there. <laughs> and, and this is a photo um, that was taken in uh, suburban Charlotte, very close to downtown um, by a resident who was like, what in the world just hopped over my front fence? And it was a coyote. And they're they're in Charlotte, they're in Raleigh, they're in they're in Chicago, they're in Los Angeles, they're in New York City. They thrive pretty much anywhere. So it's always safe to assume there's coyotes near you. Yeah, uh, yes, I'm I'm positive. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, I'm I wouldn't doubt it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the, the Wildlife Resources Commission does try to keep track of reports of wildlife activity, complaints about wildlife, any, any type of interactions that people report to us. We do maintain data on that so that we can learn what's going on out there, what, the, what are the wildlife doing, and how are people interacting with them. And with that data, we can say that despite a lot of fears of what coyotes are doing out there, this, this is really the short list of the real threats, the real damages that people are reporting to us in North Carolina. So top of the list, missing or killed outdoor cats. Cats are roughly, they're kind of at the upper end of what a coyote thinks of as, as a natural prey item. In, in nature, they eat rats, mice, moles, voles, rabbits. Um, if they can get to one, yeah, but a, rac but a fight between a raccoon and a coyote, I, I would flip a coin on who would win on that one. Um, yes, chickens, absolutely. And that's, that's kind of third on the list there. So um, when cats, oh, I'd, I'd say the same thing about the coyotes or the, uh, the raccoons. I don't know who would win on that one, especially since Canada geese can fly away um, and they, they can go into the water to hide from predators. Um, but, but, uh, you know, outdoor cats, when they are left to free roam, they are fair game and they become part of the food chain. And not only do they kill a lot of smaller wild animals, but they also can be killed by larger predators. So that's the big thing that we see with coyotes is their impacts to outdoor unsupervised free ranging cats. Um, next is off leash dogs. Especially, think about the cat situation, a small breed dog that's roughly the size of a rabbit that's out free ranging in the yard by itself with no human nearby. If a coyote sees that, they're going to say, oh, that kind of looks like lunch. <laughs> um, so off leash dogs, um, the small breed dogs can be considered to be prey items. Larger breed dogs can look a whole lot to a coyote like a weird looking coyote. And as Dr. Urbanic said, they are territorial. So if a larger breed dog walks up to a coyote, either to play or to fight, the coyote is gonna see it as potentially another coyote and it's going to defend itself and try to assert that, you know, this is my territory, you're not allowed to be here. So off leash dogs, regardless of the size, are animals that can come into contact with coyotes. And then you've got your unprotected, vulnerable livestock. Top of the list is going to be outdoor backyard chickens, free-ranging chickens. Everything eats chickens. If, if, <laughs> uh, the list of animals that eat chickens besides humans is very long. Coyotes are just one predator of chickens. So free-ranging backyard chickens definitely are fair game when it comes to being prey in an outdoor environment. Um, and then habituated individuals. So um, I think somebody asked about the, the statistics of coyotes uh, biting people. Um, most, not only, thankfully, are coyote attacks on human beings extremely rare, but most of those attacks are associated with coyotes that have actively been fed by people. 
Um, most of those situations, for whatever reason, I don't want to make any judgments, but they've mostly been in California and mostly in parks where people had developed a, a habit of trying to feed the coyotes, trying to coax them nearby, trying to pet the coyotes. And coyotes are opportunists. They're interested in getting food wherever they can get it if it doesn't put them at risk. So if they've been trained by humans to see humans as a source of food, what are they going to do? They're going to be less fearful of approaching humans. And that's when you get into situations where a coyote and a human being are close enough that a bite can happen. So habituated coyotes are bad news. We don't want them. We don't want coyotes to feel comfortable being close to people, approaching people. We want them to be afraid of us because that's healthy for us and it's healthy for coyotes. Good thing about everything on this list, like I said, this is this is what happens. Like th these are the problems that coyotes are causing. All these situations are preventable. Keep cats inside. Um, keep dogs on a leash or inside a dog-proof fence, which I'm going to talk about it. Um, keep your, your livestock in a pen or a run or a predator-proof enclosure so that they're protected from wild animals. And don't feed coyotes or try to pet them. <laughs> this, the, really, the solution to these problems are people behaving in a way that keeps coyotes out of trouble. So I behoove you to be coyote smart. Um, one, keep coyotes wild. Make sure that they understand that they are wild animals. They're not pets. They need to be afraid of humans. This is good for them. Ooh, ah. Protect your small pets and livestock. I, I think I just gave the, the list on how to do that. Focus on prevention. They're opportunistic animals. If we don't give them opportunities to you know, eat our cats or our small dogs or our free range chickens, then they're not gonna do those things. And, and I will say, in the rare situations where a coyote develops problematic behaviors, has learned that approaching humans means that it might get a food reward or has decided that cats are really, really delicious and it's preferentially going after outdoor cats, Removing the individual problem animal is a much, much, much better solution than going to war against all coyotes, because hopefully I've shown you that we, we would not never win that war. We can't. We've tried. It doesn't work. So uh, letting coyotes be when they're not causing problems. Great. When a coyote is causing problems, then removal can be a really good solution. So. Let's talk a little bit about the things that can attract coyotes and get coyotes into trouble. Um, these are some of the unnatural food sources that they can find around where people live. Um, pet food, especially dog food. Uh, coyotes are canines. Dog food is just as nutritious for coyotes as they, it is for dogs. Same thing with cat food. So you don't want to be leaving pet food outside because a coyote is going to say, man, this is just a free lunch and it keeps reappearing day after day. I'm going to hang around. This is great. Um, outdoor food refuse, so trash cans and, and garbage cans when there's a lot of food refuse. You always want to have that sort of secured from wild animals. Not just coyotes will take advantage of that, but bears, raccoons, opossums, all sorts of stuff. Um, fallen fruit, if you have any fruit trees, you know, if you know, like apples and pears and things will collect on the ground. And coyotes are not just meat eaters. They also eat fruits and vegetables that have lots of calories. So they will definitely take advantage of fallen fruit on the ground. And bird seed. Coyotes not only will directly eat bird seed, but they are very attracted to the little critters that are attracted to the bird seed. They can't read the bag that says this is bird food. As far as they're concerned, the birds are tasty, the seeds tasty, the rats are tasty. I'm going to stick around. In terms of like small prey items, this is kind of the smorgasbord that is available um, around where people live and work. Uh, we got their natural foods up at the top with your, your small rodents, your rabbits, and then we have our small vulnerable pets and livestock. So like I said before, we have control over those food resources at the bottom. Those are animals that, that we manage and it's within our control to keep those animals safe from wild predators.
I get questions about this every once in a while. This, so, so this is a product that is available um, on the market. You can, there's the, the website, coyotevest.com. I don't know if it's still valid. Um, I get questions about, about this from time to time. People say, I've got small dogs. Should I get one of these vests? Statistically speaking, when there have been altercations between, I know they're, they're very stylish. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you can pick the colors. Um, statistically speaking, when there have been reports of a coyote going after a dog, um, basically the chance that the, this happens skyrockets when there was no person around and is significantly decreased if there was a person nearby because coyotes are afraid of people. They don't want to come near us, even if there's a potentially tasty, you know, pika poodle next to you. They don't want to come near a human being because human beings are scary and they know that we are way bigger than they are. A coyote is going to stay away from a person. Um, but if your pet is all by itself, free ranging with no human nearby, that's going to be much more attractive to a coyote. So my argument here would be, you know, maybe if you were supervising your pet and you were also outside and a coyote swooped in and couldn't quite figure out really quickly how to get your dog, maybe that would give you time to run up to your pet and inter interfere. But I certainly would never leave a small dog like that by itself with a vest like that and assume that that was going to be suitable protection. So, you know, take take your own risks. I personally think that maybe it would be worthwhile having this just for the style aspect, um, but maybe not for predator protection. <laughs> they come in all the colors, really. You should if you if you want to. Go ahead and visit that website. <laughs> um, so, you know, not everybody wants to keep their, their dog on a leash, you know, 24-7 when it's outside. I understand that. I have a dog. I don't want my dog to be on a leash every single time she goes outside. But this is where the coyote-proof fence comes in. And fortunately, if it is a fence that keeps dogs in, it's going to be a fence that keeps coyotes out. Now, this is assuming that the dog that we're talking about is theoretically roughly the size of a coyote and is really relatively limber and in shape and able to jump. Um, as we see here in the, the picture on the left with a coyote that was jumping, what's well, roughly a five foot fence fairly easily. A good coyote proof fence really needs to be at least six feet tall. Uh, yeah. There's plenty of coyote. So I guess that's it would then also be safe to assume that like just because you have a dog that's in the backyard and it's probably urinating all over the property, that's not necessarily enough of a signal to a coyote to say this is someone else's territory. Oh, coyotes aren't necessarily like preferentially going and trying to find all the all the canine urine and investigate who's who. They're mostly just focused on finding food. So, so just because they smell dog urine doesn't mean that they're really paying very much attention to that because in a neighborhood, there's dog urine everywhere. I mean, that's why dogs go five feet and they have to smell everything. I was like, oh yeah, that, that's Sally. Oh yeah, that's, that's a, uh, you know, Frodo. That's, <laughs> um, so coyotes, they, they learn to ignore that really, really quickly. But if there's a, a dog that's not on a leash, that's roaming around and maybe approaching the coyote, that's that's going to be the animal that a coyote is going to have an interaction with. Um, and, you know, if it's a six foot fence, even if a coyote wanted to get in to, say, get to a really, really tiny toy breed dog, it's not going to be able to do that. Um, so but, six feet is the... Magic number. That's kind of the magic number for coyotes. Now, if you want to keep deer out, that has to be eight feet or more. <laughs> but that's a whole different presentation. Deer usually don't eat small dogs. Yeah. Um, nothing is impossible under the sun. <laughs> I have seen deer eat songbirds, but like I said, that's a totally different thing. We'll stick with coyotes. Um, 
wild animals don't tend to stick within our human categories of them very well. Um, they, they don't go to college and figure out what they can and cannot do. They just do what they want. Um, so coyotes can dig like most canines. So the, a good fence also needs to prevent digging underneath. And, and so like a regular six foot fence, fence is great, but there's all sorts of other things that you can retrofit on a fence. Like the, the middle picture is something called a coyote roller that you can buy and install on the top of a fence. And it, it rolls when you grab onto it. So it prevents animals from climbing over. And then the, on the right, you can sort of see this um, like grid work. I've thought about installing this to keep my dog from going after the squirrels. Uh, <laughs> So there's this any number of things that you can kind of DIY, but at its at its fundamental basis, six feet and prevent digging under is an excellent dog proof fence, which includes coyotes or canine proof fence, I should say. For cats, I know people always say like, oh, my cat just has to go outside. It refuses to stay inside. I can't I can't bring it in my heart to keep it inside all the time. And it's just it has to go outside. Catios are a pretty good solution for that problem. These are enclosures that allows a cat to kind of be outside-ish, but keeps it from being part of the food chain. So it prevents cats from, from killing small animals, your, all your local songbirds and your lizards, and it also keeps them safe from wild predators like coyotes. And you can buy them prefab. Here's one that I found on Google for $500. You can, you know, design your own. Basically, there's the sky's the limit on how to design these things. Uh, it just needs to be sturdy enough to keep like a dog or a coyote from getting in there. And then here's another thing to consider, which I think is kind of less important. But if you have a whole bunch of brush right up next to your house in your yard um, where you walk your dog or you've got, you know, I don't know, really small grandchildren that play or something like that. You know, removing tons of like thick, dense brush or, you know, securing outbuildings like your shed or barn or things like that from wild animals can just kind of reduce the attractiveness of the area immediately around your house to animals that might, you know, want to make a home there. Um, so, like I said, this is kind of less important as a as a, uh, a recommendation, but certainly if you have like a whole bunch of brushiness right next to your house, that's something that you can kind of clean up a little bit. So fortunately, coyotes don't tend to like to build their dens next to where there's a lot of human activity. Unlike foxes, which will build a den right under your porch, um, but coyotes tend to prefer areas where there's very, very little human activity. Um, so, you know, hopefully that's good news. They're probably not living and they, they don't like live in a den. They kind of, you know, uh, sleep under bushes or wherever was convenient when they decide to, you know, go to sleep for the day. Um, but they're, they're not likely to, you know, kind of sleep, you know, right next to a house or anywhere where there's a lot of human activity. Cause of course, when they're going to bed, human beings are waking up and becoming active and they don't want to be anywhere near that. So, you know, an abandoned lot or, or the local park, you know, those might be places that are more attractive for a coyote to rest. Um, but when they're actively hunting, they'll go anywhere. Um, and speaking of which, uh, this is this is my recommendation. If if you've got coyotes in your area, especially if you're seeing one on the regular, and you know, like I said, we want to make sure that they stay afraid of us. And they they're smart. They learn. If people never pose any kind of threat whatsoever, and maybe somebody's like trying to feed them triscuits or or dog bones, you know, they learn from those experiences progressively over time not to be afraid of people. We want to reinforce their fear, so hazing is something that we always recommend. If you see a coyote in your neighborhood and you don't want it there, communicate that to the coyote. Let it know. Engage in behaviors that tell the coyote you are not welcome here. So here's an example of a biologist in Florida demonstrating hazing. It's a coyote that was hanging around in a golf course. You can see it was just chilling, just hanging out, minding its own business. But obviously people didn't want it there. So um, this biologist just walking towards it. She's yelling. She's waving her hands, making herself look big. This is very, very basic level hazing. And if it were me, no, I mean, you can, this is, this is, 
this is pretty classic coyote behavior. If you keep walking towards them, they're going to go in the other direction. They don't want to be bothered by us. Now this, yeah, being, being assertive, being scary, you don't have to harm the coyote, but just get it to understand you can't be here and be as firm and as persistent as necessary to get that message across. They are receptive to that. It's like the reinforced balance comment there of keep going after and walking. I talked to a couple of people during these presentations saying, like, oh, I did haze it. And then it stopped and it stood its ground. And I'm like, did you stop yelling and walking towards it? Well, yeah. I'm like, well, urban animals, that flight or flight distance, you know, gets shortened when they kind of used to us, right? So if you're no longer a threat, then they're going to be like, all right, you're a weirdo. I'm going to just walk slowly this way. <laughs> yeah, I know. And they might look at you and be like, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they, they can get used to us, especially if they live in the suburbs and they see people every single day. They learn what's a threat and what's not. They learn normal human behavior and then they learn human behavior that's not normal that could put them at, at risk. So you you want to engage in that not normal behavior that gets them out of their comfort zone and gets them to realize, oh, I, I need to get out of here. But they're going to turn around and they're probably going to check me like, are you you still you're still coming after me? Yeah, okay, all right, fine. And that's that's normal. These are smart animals, but they're also smart animals that don't want to have anything to do with us, which works in our favor. So with agility, right? Like let's say sort running at which is what I would do, but I'm also crazy. <laughs> no, they're not, they are not gonna turn around and if the if the coyote has space to go in the opposite direction, that's exactly what they're going to do. If if it's like if it has run into a closet and you're still trying to pursue it, it's going to have to go through you to get away from you. But unless, like I said, unless it's completely cornered and you're still coming after it and has nowhere to go except through you. It's going to get away from you as fast as it can. That is normal, healthy, typical coyote behavior, especially if you're doing stuff like this and yelling. I mean, like, seriously, I, I would be like, get out of here, get, get like, as loud as you can, as firm as you can, because that is threatening behavior. And the coyote is going to want to get away from that. They a lot of voices that scare them, like the siren or if you had a bell that you were ringing, you know, something like Mobile, yeah, or maybe maybe you know you're you're not very mobile and and it's hard to walk. Um, this this is literally a soda can with some duct tape over top of it and some pennies inside. Um, people call this a coyote shaker. Um, it, you know it's it's basically just a noise device, and you could you could shake this, you could throw it, you could have ten of them on your back porch, and you could throw them at the coyotes, and it's not going to hurt them, but it's going to scare them. Especially if you were to hit a coyote with this, it's going to it's going to really decide like, oh, OK, never mind. I'm not I'm not hanging around in that backyard anymore. Um, the objective is to scare the coyote and let it know that you are boss, but not necessarily to injure it, but, um, just to be firm enough that he, it understands that message that this is your territory. They're territorial animals and they understand if there's a bigger, scarier animal that occupies that territory, that coyote is going to know, you know, that's that's um, not an area where it needs to hang out. <laughs> Um, coyotes will get acclimated to anything that's persistently in the environment all the time and never changes. So all those, and that's for a lot of wildlife, honestly. So scare devices that revolve around like a fake owl or something that looks scary, but it doesn't move. They'll, they'll be afraid for five minutes and then they're like, oh, never mind. That's, that's nothing. And then they get used to it and they ignore it basically. Um, but coyotes especially, like they'll be afraid at first to a lot of novel items, like things that they're not experienced with. But once they realize it's not a threat, they don't care anymore. Okay, so, you know, kind of like when I mentioned before, it, leaving the coyotes alone isn't 100% the best option because every once in a blue moon, very, very rarely, you might get a situation where a coyote 
you know, does require more intervention. And, and this, this is something that I want to make sure that I express to you so that if you have doubts, I want you to know that there are options. Um, you know, if, if a coyote is being aggressive, like I said, this is very, very rare. But, you know, if, if this is happening, you know, you, you might need to do something about that particular animal. Um, if a coyote loses its fear of people, maybe because somebody's feeding it dog bones, um, approaching people, especially like, like it's looking for food or unfazed, like completely unfazed when you're trying to haze it and an animal that has just like, like, I don't care about people. I'm, I'm done. I don't care. Um, in those situations, targeting and removing that particular problem individual can be a good solution. I do want to briefly talk about a behavior called escorting. So as, as Dr. Urbanic mentioned, um, she's had reports where people have said like, or in, in the survey, people said like a coyote like came towards me, but then when she kind of asked more questions about what was that interaction like, then, you know, the person kind of was saying like, well, maybe it wasn't chasing me. Maybe I'm not sure now that I think about it, but in the moment I felt really scared. Um, so during the breeding season, when they have young pups, they are excellent parents and coyotes will do everything in their power to protect their pups from a threat, even if it puts them in a situation where they're, they're afraid for their own safety. And so, like I said, coyotes don't tend to like to den where a lot of people and human activity is, but they will den in parks where there might be a lot of hikers. There might be people walking dogs. And um, during the breeding season, when they have pups, uh, we see an uptick in experiences where people are walking in these kind of remote areas and they see a coyote just staring at them. And then maybe maybe they're as they're walking along the, the path, the coyote might actually like kind of walk with them at a distance, but but sort of kind of you know keep keeping up with them and keeping an eye on them. And that usually is a good indication that there's a den nearby or there are pups nearby. And basically that coyote is just keeping an eye on the threat and making sure that the threat doesn't get any closer to their pups. When, when the coyotes engage in this behavior, usually they just stand and watch. And, you know, if you were to try to haze a coyote in that situation, it's probably going to hold its ground. It's not going to attack unless you found a pup on the ground and picked it up. But it's going to basically try to put itself between you and its den to keep its pups safe. Can I call trees? Mm, not very well, no. <laughs> Gray foxes are really, really good, great at climbing, but coyotes not so much. Um, so, so we don't count that as an aggressive behavior because they're not attacking unprovoked. And usually it doesn't involve any kind of attack whatsoever, but they're keeping an eye on you. And basically, as soon as you leave that immediate area where the den is, they lose all interest. They go back to what they were doing. Um, so the best way to handle these types of situations, keep your dog leashed, because if your dog is running after the coyote, you know, it might have to defend its pups um, and just just leave. You know, you don't have to run away. You don't have to haze it. It's, I mean, it's like I said, it's not going to leave its den. It's going to protect its pups. But if you just leave, then that that behavior ceases as soon as you're a safe distance away and the coyote feels like its pups are safe. Um, just real quick, this is the peak seasons where we receive reports about coyote encounters or coyote sightings. Basically, during pup rearing season, when and that's, um, was it May through July? That's when coyote parents, both the male and the female, excellent parents, they don't sleep when they've got young pups because they have to hunt day and night to feed all those hungry mouths. So adult coyote activity goes up remarkably um, because they're just trying to keep their pups alive. And then this time of year in October and November, we see another spike in sightings and that's related to the dispersal of those young pups from the spring they're going off on their own, like, bye, mom and dad, I'm going to go and find my own territory, find a mate, and make my own way. And they're basically young and stupid, and they don't know where they're going, and they're wandering in areas where they're not familiar, and so people tend to see them more. And then, of course, by December, they've kind of figured things out a little bit, and they go back to being kind of cryptic and good at hiding from people. Okay, so like I said, I do want to talk about all the legal options. And Dr. Urbanek did kind of mention um, the, the full range of options that are, are available in North Carolina. 
Um, hunting and trapping are the primary methods for, for lethal removal of coyotes. They cannot be relocated. You can't pick them up and take them and drop them off somewhere else. They'll go right back to their territory anyway. It doesn't work. Um, so, you know, if you really are having problems, you can hire a wildlife control agent, which is an individual who is trained by the Wildlife Commission and licensed to be able to do wildlife removals in situations where a wild animal is causing damage. They will not come and remove a coyote because you don't like coyotes and you don't want them around. But if you have a coyote that's actively causing damage, then that's a different situation. And that goes for a variety of wild animals. Um, like if you have a raccoon in your attic, they can come and help you with that. Um, also, because there is a trapping season that um, coyotes can be trapped, you can contact a licensed trapper and invite them onto your property to trap any fur-bearing animal or coyotes that you want removed. Um, the laws around hunting, there's a year-round coyote hunting season. You have to have a hunting license. And in that small five county area where we have red wolves, there are increased restrictions. I'm going to go over this real quick because I imagine this isn't super relevant to you. And of course, local laws apply. If you live in a city or an HOA or something that prohibits discharge of firearms, obviously you're not going to be able to hunt coyotes. Um, with trapping, um, you need a trapping license and the season runs from October 1st to the end of February. This right here is the type of trap that's used to trap coyotes. You've seen several pictures so far of coyotes in these traps. These are called foothold traps. They are designed specifically to be very humane and to basically just hold the animal without harming it until the trapper comes to do what they're gonna do with the animal. I have one right here. And if you wanna see it or ask more questions after the presentation, I can kind of show you a little bit more. But this this is what, what's used. A lot of the, uh, the media show these like traps with like big scary teeth on them. That has been illegal for a very, very long time. These traps do not have teeth on them. They cannot have teeth on them. They actually have padding to make them more comfortable for the animal. Um, these traps are the reason why we have red wolves in North Carolina, because this is how we, we trap and move wild animals without harming them. So just, just as a perspective, this is how we actually get biological data on our current red wolves. These traps are set, we catch the wolves, we you know work them up, and then we release them unharmed. So. I didn't know my students when I taught them how to set those, you would set it off in their hands so that they can feel it. And they'd be like, oh, okay. It's <laughs> just like a tight grip. And they're like, okay, get it. <laughs> no one's going home, I'm gonna be able to do that at the university because no one's going home with a broken arm or a broken hand or anything. They're like, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> Now, there's just pretty strict standards for making sure that what traps are legal or are as humane as they possibly can be. Um, euthanized, pretty much. Um, so you, you cannot relocate them, and some trappers will sell them to, as Dr. Urbanic men mentioned, a licensed fox hunting preserve. Basically, they go into a fence with other coyotes or foxes, and then they get chased with dogs for to train the dogs for hunting. Um, but they you can't you can't relocate a coyote um, elsewhere. You can release it though. Maybe a trapper was actually trying to trap uh, foxes, and they caught a coyote. They they can release it from the trap right where they caught it, and that's that's always okay. Is there? Oh, there's a whole strategy for it. You know, um, if it were me, like I haven't done too much trapping, but I would need somebody else. It, usually like a catch pole helps and they'll secure the animal and then somebody will come in and, and remove the trap. The, the guys who are really good at it can like do the catch pole and, and the, the trap all at once. I, I am not anywhere near as good as they are. But um, yeah, there's basically there you you kind of pry the, the trap open and it opens up and the animal can get its foot out. Um, and then outside of the trapping season, there is something called a depredation permit that's necessary to set a trap for any wild animal. And that's free and the Wildlife Commission issues it. And if you wanna know more, I can tell you more about that. But um, I think finally, uh, if you have any questions about coyotes or any other wild animals, I encourage you to get familiar with this phone number. It's on the Wildlife Commission's website. There's an email address. Basically, this, this number is staffed by four full-time wildlife biologists 
who are there to answer the phones and answer people's questions about pretty much any wildlife question, whether it's a problem with a wild animal or somebody found a baby bird on the ground and they want to know what to do with it, any of that stuff. So this is an excellent resource um, just, just to get the right information to know what to do. And then we have a special page just about coyote information, all of our regulations, biology information, ways to prevent conflicts. Our coyote page has got tons and tons of good stuff including our North Carolina Coyote Management Plan. We actually have a management plan that talks about the effectiveness of educating people, the effectiveness of changing people's behavior to prevent coyote problems, and also the effectiveness or not of attempts to eradicate coyotes and all sorts of good stuff. So if you really want to get into the nitty gritty about coyote management, that plan is an excellent read. And with that, how are we doing on time? We have questions. We got, I guess we're over. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for letting me talk. <laughs> we we had lots of questions throughout, which was great. Yeah. And I I have a doggy door, so he can go outside anytime he wants to do his business with a little bit of a fence in backyard for him to go into to do his business. But it's two feet high. Mm. So that's useless against a coyote. Yep. So is it not, do you think it's not even safe for me to allow him? To, I'm gone a lot. Like I've been gone about 10 hours today. He's home by himself. Yeah. He can go out when he needs to be. His food is there, everything inside, everything. So at night, like right now, or what I'm hearing you say, I should have his doggy door closed so he can't go out by himself at night. That would be well, part of my recommendation. Yeah. That would be fine. <laughs> that would be fine. The daytime, is it safe that he can go out? I mean, he loves to be inside. He's kind of an indoor smoke. But he, because he doesn't go out and play a lot, but he goes outside when he needs to do his business. And then he comes right back in yeah. through his doggy door. Uh, I just, you know, I'm trying to think how can I keep my dog safe? Yeah. Um, but a lot, but I can't be home all the time and I live alone. Yeah, that's, that's tough. And it's, it's a gradient of risk, you know, yeah. letting him go out that, that does, that does put him at risk. Um, the, uh, there's an option of, of working on the fencing. Um, people are often really afraid of electric fencing, but a hot wire can do wonders to keep wildlife out. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of potential options. I, I don't know what the, the best option would be, but letting him go out on his own without any supervision is putting him at risk. Daytime, Coyotes can be active anytime they feel like it. I will also say this though, is that especially in an urban area, um, like here, is that if you leave your dog door, your, the doggy door open at night, and you said, you know, you've got the food there and things like that, you know, there's plenty of opportunities for raccoons, possums, lots of things to come right into your house. I mean, like, oh, what's in here? You know, as soon as they kind of like, you know, they have to come across it, right? They have to smell it. They have to be opportunistic about it. But that's not to say it won't happen because, I mean, you can just Google YouTube or anything like that. You'll find lots of videos of it. Curtis, you had a question. So, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. As something that the um, for those that uh, may need to leave, um, feel free to do so. Oh, yeah. Um, for we'll talk first. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be here all night. What was your plan? So I was just going to say, can you do the doggy door? So I was thinking, okay, we get that by the way, but so these can go into the doggy door, right? It's a, it's a big enough. Yeah. I mean, they make different sizes, so, you yeah. know, of doggy doors. If it, if it was like a really, really teeny one, they'd probably have a hard time, but yeah. 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 <laughs> About the monkey punishing a wooded area, the cypress. Oh, yeah, but you can also at night. I go off and I'll check out the paddock. Sometimes it chases deer, whatever, but they come right. Yes, I didn't say because there are coyotes 
I have heard owl not the coldest in my house, but in the distance towards the side one night, and it was the howl also there, and then I was out there. And then I was now that was before the film was out. But, so I, I figured that there, I mean, there you go in my slides. That's that's definitely good. It, it, it kind of depends on the dog. Like if you said you had like a, a 50 pound elderly dog that was really infirm and, and just unable to protect itself, I, I would say I wouldn't leave that dog by itself, especially at dawn and dusk or, or at night. But, you know, a good, strong, healthy dog, a coyote's not, like I said, they're risk averse. They don't, they don't want to get into a fight with an animal where they're going to get hurt. Yeah. So a good, strong, healthy, big enough dog, like my dog's 60 pounds, she's part pit bull. When I when I let her run in um, areas where it's free to run dogs, she usually stays mostly within sight, and I don't worry about coyotes because she would mess a coyote up. <laughs> um, and you know, they like I said, they're going to run the opposite direction if it's if it's something they don't want to get hurt. They don't have doctors. <laughs> They don't, most, most wild animals will not get into a truly aggressive situation where they can injure themselves because that's probably a death sentence. So they, they don't want to get into fights. Yeah. And they're not, I don't think that's the Lord. So I'm saying, I don't know. So if you have your lights out too. So you turn the lights, if you put like lights out when you come out and then see if the lights on, you are out there. And then there are two big dogs chasing things like as a as a, almost as a made of pair, right? <laughs> yeah, now even if they're not a pair, right? You know, they're like a big pack. Like a coyote's gonna be like, whoa, okay. <laughs> but I don't mess with that. Yeah. Look at this. Okay, so I have a question. Yeah. Given I didn't know like there was such a wide range in coloring. So, so given that, like and I just realized that the coyote is so small. So, so like, it's like it's it's if you see something that's got yeah, reddish, what, like what are the odds that the coyote was a fox? Oh, yeah. So red foxes are pretty, they're pretty orange looking. And they like, have, it's going to be super orange, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, it's like orange. And they've got, got black stockings on their pockets. Oh, yes, yes, there you go. Yeah, right there. Perfect. They've got, they've got the red, uh, black legs. Um, they've got yeah, white tail tip. tip. They, they just have this really stark set of going. It was like, so it's going to be very obviously worse. I would. You'd be more likely to stay at high looking for, for like a yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, a lot of times in like cartoons and things like that. So I live, it's like the zip code. She was, everybody's ready to use Nice and 2405. So about every other day on the camera, they're posting a cat being taken. And there you know, and they like to show pictures of it, you know, parts and all. And that's it. That's what she and, you know, I was all about hating them and all. But I've bought wolf urine, but that's probably asinine. That's not going to help because they've never smelled a wolf around here. And they'll probably attract them. Uh, I don't want to do that because. So, uh, but if I do want to take measures, yeah. uh, I could dispatch one with a crossbow in New Hanover County. I, with it a, depends on where you are. I know. As best I can tell uh, from the powers that be calling you, yeah. it's good. I bought it. Uh, oh, uh, it's a license. Yeah. license. Yeah. Got the crossbow. Yeah. And he is if your only tank was. Uh, is it discharge of fire? She told me. Recently discharge of weapon, New Hanover, and uh, Wilmington is discharge of fire. Yeah, it's like, I, I, when you're talking about local ordinances, I, I like never want to give advice because every, every local yeah, yeah, yeah. government makes it different. Some of them say, say like dangerous projectiles, which I mean, you can't even use a slingshot. Yeah. Um, but then I was like, okay, and I'm like, well, I mean, my the one thing is like you see where like yeah, where I live in this general neighborhood, you had like twenty cats go yeah, within the last. Yeah, uh, so that's that's it, probably the it, resident coyotes that that's the same ones going on. Oh, yeah. But then I'm like, oh, I feel bad because you say they make for. <laughs> <laughs> and once once the cat once that food resource is gone, mm -hmm. yeah, once no, the cat's going away. Yeah. I learned about this today. Awesome. <laughs> it was interesting. I heard the coyote the other night at my own. Uh, I live by yeah, Green Street Lake. Oh, cool. So, yeah, that I learned a lot. And hopefully, because I know someone lost a cat to one the other week. Yeah, and give this on pass this on to him. Oh yeah, yeah, good. And I'm taking yeah, wildlife yeah. management next semester with um. Talk to everybody with Sami. Yeah. So and then you're almost done. Almost done, and then I'll be looking for. I have a lot of people who are looking for me. So I have. That's awesome. So proud. Very cool. Yeah. And I was going to go, I saw all the dogs and cats, so I'm going to get my pepper spray, <laughs> and then I went like, oh, stop. That's yeah. not a, that's not a, yeah, it's not a yodel that the cat makes more of a, yeah, and then I went like, oh, that's, that's not a cat yodel, that's a coyote call. Oh, okay. Well, it sounded like an owl to me for a second. I have those too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, it's kind of neat. So yeah, hopefully I learned a lot about this and yeah. took some notes. Yeah, that's 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 next semester I'll be probably testing um, on this. Oh, oh there's that's, up. that's up. That's up to her. But yeah. um, uh, you know, I, I, I think that I, honestly, I got a lot of respect for coyotes. They're really, they're really neat animals. Um, they're beautiful. They're beautiful, and you know, like I said, you know, sometimes there's. Like lethal removal is is very justified, but doing it because you just hate them for no good reason isn't really a great reason because it's not very effective. <laughs> yeah, especially if you get a 